Okay. Uh, I'm going to repeat that point because I don't think I covered that point last time. And I think it's an important point. And so I'm going to repeat uh, just that 56th verse uh, elaboration on that. Uh, so here in this particular verse, Krishna is mentioning uh, that one who is free from, one whose mind is steady, right? But one of the symptoms is that one is free from attachment, fear, and anger. And these three aspects, attachment, fear, and anger, these are three qualitative aspects of the time. We are generally, uh, you know, frustrated about things that have happened in the past. And that frustration is what leads into anger, right? So there is lamentation in the past. And then fear is always about the future. We don't know, you know, we are we never fearful about the past, right? Whatever has happened, no matter how horrible the situation we were put in in the past, it's over. And so we don't fear that. We might fear that it might happen again in future, or we might be fearful of things that have not happened yet, but might happen in the future. So fear is associated with future. And attachment or illusion is generally, it's mostly related to the present, right? Because uh, any time and every single moment we have a choice to do choice to uh, select what options uh, yeah, it's like we are at a fork at every moment in time and we our choices are affected by our attachments our illusions so in this way we at every single moment we are inflicted in all the three tenses um, in spiritual world time is not present uh, because these three qualitative aspects of the time are not manifested in the spiritual world in the spiritual world, there is no fear, there is no anger, uh, and there is no attachment. And so, one when one is free, uh, uh, when one is steady, one's mind is steady, then one is free from all these three aspects: uh, attachment, fear, and anger. So, we'll continue from verse number fifty-seven. Yaha sarvatra na snehas. Translation and purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Shri Prabhupada. Translation, in the material world, one who, has un, one who is unaffected by whatever good or evil he may obtain, neither praising it nor despising it, is firmly fixed in perfect knowledge. It's a very important verse. Uh, I'll read the purport. There is always upheaval in the material world, which may be good or evil. One who is not agitated by such material upheavals, who is unaffected by good and evil, is to be understood to be fixed in Krishna consciousness. As long as one is in the material world, there is always the possibility of good and evil, because the world is full of dualities. But one who is fixed in Krishna consciousness is not affected by good and evil because he is simply concerned with Krishna, who is all good, absolute. Such consciousness is Krishna. In such consciousness in Krishna situates one in perfect transcendental position called samadhi. That's a technical word. Uh, so very, 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 very important words. Uh, so. The perspective of a self-realized soul is described over here. And the self-realized soul is completely pure and is qualitatively same as Krishna himself. Though quantitatively there is a difference, qualitatively is the same because Krishna also makes no distinction between the mundane good and the mundane bad. Right? We see so many examples in Srimad Bhagavatam. Uh, well, all the demons Asuras, you were very envious of Krishna, right? They achieved the same destination as the devotees, right? So Putana, Putana, she was the first demon who was killed by Krishna. Krishna was hardly a few days old. And then uh, Putana comes uh, to poison the baby. So she puts poison on her breasts and tries to uh, nurse the child. But Krishna, he just takes the essence and leaves the rest. He says, well, you know, because he offered her breasts uh, to, to feed her milk to me, she's my mother. And so uh, he does suck the life air out of her and she dies, but says, because, you know, uh, he, she breastfed me, she's my mother. After she, 
died, she was elevated to the spiritual world and uh, obtained the position of one of the elderly gopis who are in the uh, you know mood of parental affection. So what did Krishna look? Well, he just looked at you know she is thinking about me. So she, you know so that's why, and she wanted to serve me. That's why Krishna is known as absolute. In mathematics, we have absolute function. So if you pass negative one thousand to that function, the outcome is positive one thousand. If you pass positive one thousand, still the outcome is positive one thousand. And so uh, that's what it means absolute. The function is absolute. It just looks at the absolute value. And uh, that's why it says whether one chants the name of Krishna jokingly or with devotion or in a satiric way or and you know uh, indirectly referring to Krishna. Krishna ignores all that and he says, oh, you know, this person is calling me and then he just accepts that uh, as a as a, a gesture of devotion. And then that individual makes spiritual progress. So the perspective of the self-realized soul is also like that. They overlook the mundane evil and mundane good also right it's not that uh, because they know that both are two opposite sides of the same coin right and they are not firmly placed last class i gave an example that even those who are in goodness sattva gun they cannot maintain sattva gun forever right what was this verse haro abhaktasya kuto mahan guno mano rathena dhavati bahihi one who is not fixed in in devotion, that person, even if that individual is exhibiting good qualities, in you know those qualities are not sustainable, because under the effect of time, what will happen? You know, one will eventually be frustrated. He says because the nature of the world is that we will always be put into difficulties, and then that person might think, what did I get from being a good man? You know, I was always honest. It's possible. It might happen in this lifetime or next. The time actually forces us. The modes are always changing. The modes are never constant. So the three modes of nature are like the three strings that, you know, control the pup us like puppets. The modes are always changing. And then one can go into mode of passion. And then one becomes very passionate, wants to achieve things, want to, be, you know, be a success. There might be some successes that come, but then one tries to, you know, judge like, hey, was it was that success worth? Or sometimes some just gets frustrated, like, hey, you know, I, I have all this, but I cannot enjoy. Like, you know, Arjuna was feeling like that. Even if I win, what's the point? And uh, one might go into the mode of ignorance. Actually, the symptoms that Arjuna was exhibiting was kind of in the mode of ignorance. He's giving up, you know, he's giving up one's duties. Right, kind of a depressive kind of attitude, and one might take to intoxication or uh, uh, you know it could be a lot of other vices. So one can easily go from passion to ignorance, and being after being in ignorance for some time, one might say that you know what you know it's this lamentation is not helping me. I'm just destroying my life, and they might try to come out of it. So the modes are constantly changing. So even the mundane goodness as well as the mundane evil right they they are happening under the influence of the modes of nature which are never constant and so the self realized soul is able to see that that's why they do not praise right they do not praise when they see good qualities uh, uh, in someone unless that person is self realized and those good qualities are an extension or a natural outcome of that self realization uh, and they're firmly fixed, and that's a different story. But otherwise, uh, those who are self-realized, neither they praise someone who might have those, those qualities, nor do they despise if they are lacking those qualities, or even if uh, you know they they have the uh, mundane evil qualities. That's why uh, the six Goswamis of Vrindavan, the followers of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, in the in the Sad Goswami Ashtakam, the song. Uh, in the glorification of the six Goswami, it says that dhira adhira jana priyo. So six Goswamis were, uh, were uh, you know, uh, appeared pleasing to those who were good as well as those who were charlatans, you know, dhira adhira. Right? So those who are dhira or fixed or in, in goodness and those who are not fixed in goodness. 
right? All of them, they appreciated or, you know, they were attracted by the six Goswamis. Why? Because that is the nature of a pure devotee. You know, they, 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 they see uh, everyone with equal vision. Of course, they understand the distinction. It's not that they are not, they are blind. But then, uh, because they don't neither praise nor do they despise uh, those who are evil, uh, they, they, are, they are liked. Yeah, they are liked by everyone. So in that verse, we find uh, Sadhu Goswami has to come. Another example that uh, comes in scriptures a lot is Narada Muni. So if you have, you know, uh, from Bhagavatam, other Puranas, uh, every time you see, Narada Muni is one personality, is welcomed by the Suras, and is welcomed by the Asuras, both. Right, He's, you know, otherwise the demigods, right, the suras, the devas, and asuras, they're always fighting with each other, right? There's some conflict. But Narad Muni goes to the devas also, he goes to the asuras also, he's welcomed by both. He's considered like a neutral uh, kind of so, party, he's transcendental, just like you know, uh, after Krishna had taken birth, Narad Muni comes and visit Kamsa, and Kamsa welcomes Narad Muni and he serves him nicely. And Narad Muni says, uh, Narad Muni knows that there was this Akashwani which said that the eighth son of Devaki is going will, will kill Kamsa. And then he gives instruction to Kamsa. He said, uh, what happened? The first child was born. And after that, what happened? So Kamsa says, yeah, I left, let him go. Ansuman was his name. He said, I didn't kill him. Uh, because it, I have to worry about the eighth child, right? So I, I spared the life of the first one. So Narad Muni says, oh, that might be a mistake because when you say eight, you don't know eight from what position. Is it eight from the beginning or eight from the end? Right? And so, you know, you, your, if your reference is not fixed, your first child could, uh, the, the first child could be the eighth one. You never know. So Kamsa says, yes, you're right. So you know, Kamsa trusted Narada Muni. So immediately goes and, you know, he kills the first and the second and next, you know, he, you know, he, he becomes uh, extremely more envious, right? And intolerant. And then he kills every single baby that's born to Devaki. Again, Narada Muni, somebody might question, why did Narada Muni, uh, you know, say something? He knew what Kamsa will do. And he caused unnecessary death of those, uh, you know, the sons of Devaki. And uh, the way to understand Narada Muni was very eager for Lord Krishna to appear soon. Right? So if, if, if Kamsa is, gets more inimical, then Lord also might, you know, the it would, uh, if the child is killed, then the what will happen is Devaki and Vasudev might be uh, eager to beget another child faster, and that would expedite the Lord's arrival. So Narada Muni's uh, goal was that. But the point is that uh, uh, again, there is a inner story. You know, there's a deeper story behind who those eight, uh, the the previous sons of Devaki were. Anyway, Krishna later brings them back to life uh, 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 later in, in Bhagavatam, that pastime is mentioned. Again, yeah, but the point is that uh, the pure devotees like Narada Muni, they are, they are respected both by the demigods and the demons, and they trust him. And so uh, and, uh, the, the pure devotees, their activities are transcendental and cannot easily understand that. And so they neither praise nor despise. Uh, any questions on this particular verse? Okay, verse number 58. Yada sam harate chayam. Sorry. Yada sam harate chayam. Kurmo anga niva sarvasa. Indriyani indriyarthe bias. Tasya Pragya Pratishtita. Translation, one who is able to withdraw his senses from sense objects as a tortoise draws its limbs within the shell is firmly fixed in perfect consciousness. So here the analogy or the metaphor uh, uh, is given and is compared to that of a tortoise. And the tortoise is such a creature that one uh, it can withdraw its limbs and senses, right? So especially when there is a danger, what does a tortoise do, right? It would, or is a very hard shell that can protect it from any kind of danger. 
especially if there's some other creature trying to prey upon it. And uh, in that way, the tortoise protects it. Similarly, one who is Dira, that person uh, is able to withdraw the senses when put into a situation where senses could be inflicted by sense objects. And those sense objects could be favorable or could be unfavorable in both scenarios, right? So we should not think uh, one or the other, it's both, right? Just in the previous verse, it was mentioned that such a person uh, is beyond the mundane good and the evil. So the, the dualities do not affect it. So those sense object either might be pleasing or displeasing. In either case, one is able to withdraw uh, its limbs. So it doesn't it literally, it does not mean literally that such a person, you know, whenever situation that like, runs away physically, it's a mental filter, right? And, you know, you, you don't have to think uh, that, you know, person runs away from the situation or covers one's eyes or ears, like, I don't want to see this, I want to hear this, not in that fashion. Um, that would be very superficial. But what it means that one is not affected. You know, one while being remaining in such a situation, uh, one does not let those sense uh, objects uh, inflict one's senses. In the purport, Sri Prabhupada writes, so this, this is a test of a yogi, right? Just like when we, every, the, the, there are tests for everything. And it says that uh, we, 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 if you want to test, uh, one's friendship with someone right so when things are favorable uh, everyone could be would be one's friend especially when he's successful and rich and powerful that person will attract a lot of friends but then in english we have the say, saying fair weather friend right when the we, when the weather is nice then everyone uh, is willing uh, when the situations are fine then everyone's your friend so the test of a friend is when things are not favorable, when we are in difficulty, who who comes to help you out? That is a test. Then he, at that time, you one can find out who is one's real friend. Right? The test of a warrior comes in the battlefield. Hmm? There is a nice uh, Sanskrit sloka. I'm not able to remember. Shatru Pariksha, what is it? Uh, Ranangane is it the test against? If you want to test your enemy. Right, Mitra Pariksha. Yeah, yeah, it's been a while. I learned this in school. It's not in the Bhagavatam or Bhagavad Gita. But yeah, when one put it, one is put into difficulty, then at the time we can know who we, one can find out who who is one's friend. Similarly, what is the test of a yogi? You know, everyone can uh, you know put a dhoti, a kurta, put a tilak, and claim to be a devotee. But uh, one does not become devotee by assuming external symbols. Right. The the test is when 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 one is put into a situation and one is able to control one's senses. Uh, that is a test. So most people they are not Goswamis. Goswami means go means senses. Go also means cow. Right. Goswami means one who is a master of one's senses. Most people they are not master of their senses. They are servants of their senses. So they are called Godasa. So, you know, they, 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 they do not have understanding of how this body is working, what is gross body, what is subtle body, how the mind is connected to the senses, how intelligence sits upon the mind and, you know, how ego sits between the intelligence and the soul. Intelligence is a driver and, you know, how the interaction of all these elements happen. Most people, they are just, they act impulsively. So whatever the impulses they receive from the senses, they are generally overcome by it. They, they, they uh, say that uh, they take the dictation of the senses. But what do they claim? They claim this is freedom, especially in America. You know, it's, everything's about freedom. I should have the freedom not to wear masks, right? Even though there's a pandemic, it's my choice. You know, you know so the, 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 there is a uh, lot of emphasis on uh, the, that one should be able to do whatever one likes. So they call it as a freedom, but it's not freedom. Freedom, it's not freedom. What, what's happening? They, they're acting under the dictation of the impulses that the senses are receiving from the sense objects. 
you say you know, I, I should have like uh, now a lot of states they allow marijuana, right? Uh, yeah, so there might be a lot of reasons why they allow, but uh, the, the the idea the the argument is that that you know people they they should have the freedom to decide what is good for them, but in reality, well, what's a, it's not freedom. They the they are they are they are under the dictation. You know there, there is an addiction. You know there is a strong desire to to have that intoxicant, right? So that's just one example. But whatever goes on in the names of freedom is not freedom. Actually, it is binding. One is bound by the desires of one's senses. That is a real freedom means not to be subjected by the demands of the senses. That is real freedom, right? So that is Goswami. For that, one has to become Goswami. One has to arise above the level of being a Godasa. Mr. Prabhupada is mentioning that most, most people are Godas. I mean, they are servant of their senses. So that is the answer to the question of how yogi is situated. That was Arjuna's original question. Uh, senses, they are compared to serpents, right? Snakes. They want to act very loosely. They want to, you know, without any restriction. But a devotee is one who can control the serpent-like senses just as a snake charmer controls the snakes. What does a snake charmer do? Right, he plays the bean, which is a kind of a uh, musical instrument. But it makes sound of certain vibration that the snake is is is, is snake doesn't have eyes, but it's it's uh, it senses the world through the vibrations. And the vibrations of the bean, when they sung, uh, you know, when played by an expert snake charmer, they they can uh, mesmerize, kind of. Uh, the, uh, must memorize the snake and the snake is just still at one position right and uh, such a snake is harmless right it won't so the yogi the the yogi is one who can control the snake like senses and compared to snake because if they are not controlled the senses can drive one to a place of degradation you know it will bring about the degradation of the soul if the senses are not restricted uh, so a yogi never allows the senses to act independently, just like that chariot driver is controlling the horses very expertly. So one, one has to control one's senses in a very expert way. So there are many injunctions in the scriptures which would tell, which would say, well, this is what you should, one should do, and this is what one should not do, this is how one should control the senses. And so in this way, there are a lot of different means which are described in the scripture. Uh, and unless one is able to follow this ni yama niyama, right? Allowances and restrictions. Uh, unless one is able to do that, then it's not possible to make advancement in Krishna consciousness or in anything for that matter. Uh, you know, unless one has a discipline and one is, we, I think a couple of verses ahead, we said, Vyavasaitma ka buddhi, we discussed. When, 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 when the intelligence is not many branched, if the intelligence is branched, many branched, then you cannot focus on one thing. Our effort is distributed across multiple uh, goals. Um, or in this case, it's wasted in simply sense gratifications of different varieties. Uh, so one has to be fixed. So in this case, that example is given. Just uh, we discussed that tortoise can withdraw its senses and limbs. And it can again bring them out or bring them forth uh, when, whenever it wants. And the tortoise has the ability and the uh, will to do that when it chooses. So similarly, we have to control our senses in the same fashion. Senses of Krishna conscious persons are used only for particular purpose in the service of the Lord and they are withdrawn otherwise. So this is training. It, it's a matter of training, and that's why uh, when we practice sadhana bhakti, just like in music, they use the word sadhana, or the Arabic term they use, or the Urdu term is riyas or practice. So sadhana bhakti is also practice. We might not naturally have love and devotion for the Lord, but when we are, when we follow certain steps and rituals, 
we are forced to put uh, put ourselves in a situation where we can have the opportunity to apply the right consciousness because everyone needs for instance everyone needs to have food and you know we have this tendency to make and enjoy food for our own gratification but when we cultivate the habit of offering that bhoga to krishna first to the deities and then uh, honoring it as prasadam then we are forced to think that okay i'm making this for the lord's pleasure and i'm eating the remnants so this is just one activity but in this way every activity can be dovetailed we don't have to stop the activities of our senses but those senses have to be dovetailed in the service of krishna so i gave the example of this devotee what he does is every month he reads the accounts to the deities at his home he says well this is the income i had you know this is your money uh, and you know this is how i spend it so you know he is holding himself accountable to the lord you know just like bharat he was ruling ayodhya on behalf of lord rama he never assumed the throne he put the footwear paduka of lord rama on the throne and he Uh, he executed his duties just as a servant of Lord Rama. So, um, by the many examples uh, which are very inspiring, and we can imbibe that mood, and in this way we can dovetail the senses in the service of Krishna. Any questions on this particular verse? Prabhu ji, I think we have discussed this in the past also. But like, how do we dovetail our day-to-day -day activities? Like when I am working, doing my my stuff for my work my office and then any yeah. other thing like how do i yeah. dovetail all the activities towards you know thinking right. about krishna yeah so yeah you know this is the most perplexing question that we have and uh, sometimes we think that you know only if i did not have this job or if i had enough money you know i don't have to do any work i'll just 24 hours either read about krishna or you know chant his names i will i will do this service so we we have this i wish you know this was a situation we all think like that but uh, the reality is that we we are not at that stage and even if we had all that time and all the money that we don't have to maintain ourselves we will simply squander or waste that time you, you know Uh, and we won't be engaged 24 hours in the service of krishna that is our limitation and uh, if you want you can try it out maybe you know on a vacation or something and you don't have a lot of obligation you think okay you know make an arrangement no one's going to bother you you have all 24 hours and you see how how many what percentage of those 24 hours you are, one is able to chant the names of krishna constantly or just read bhagavatam i'm going to read bhagavatam for 12 hours I'm going to read Bhagavad Gita for 12 hours, and all you 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 know taking care of the children, the family, other things. You're free, assume, right? And somebody else is taking it. Just one day, and we'll soon realize we are not able to do it. So uh, that state cannot be artificially achieved, right? And um, we, you know that stage of nishkam or akarma. There are two margs. I say pravritti marg and nivritti marg. Nivritti. is where one is fully absorbed in uh, the pastimes and service of the lord and is free from the obligations of the prescribed duties uh, according to one's varna and ashram right so one has achieved that stage of perfection uh, such persons they can choose to be in nivritti marg or they can continue in pravritti marg though there are, though there is no need for them to continue uh, doing their prescribed duties but just to set an example because they are indifferent just like they are indifferent from mundane good and mundane evil when one is self realized all these prescribed duties they do not have any necessary purpose so they neither like it nor do they despise it and so they may, they might as well continue to do it so that's the case of perfect state devotees but otherwise when we are still practicing sadhana bhakti even if we had all the time and money we won't be able to be uh, constantly engaged in the service and remembrance of the lord so for us that work is becomes important right and so we have to act according uh, to the prescribed duties which are prescribed according to one's varna and ashram and uh, that activity uh, engagement becomes very important now how do we purify that 
Yes, that's the next question. Just like, uh, well, why do you need to purify first of all? Because we want to offer that as a service to the Lord. Just like the bhoga that I want to offer to Krishna, I want to make sure that ingredients are pure. They are not used. If I use it, then I cannot offer to the Lord, right? I want it to be of the best quality. And then it needs to be prepared in good consciousness. So the material should be good when I, when I procure the produce that I get from the market. Uh, the utensils or the instruments by in which the food is cooked, that also should be pure. Right. The consciousness of the person who is cooking should also be pure or the intention uh, that, in, that I am really preparing this for Krishna's satisfaction. And so by all this, the food becomes uh, worthy of offer being offered to the Lord. Now, when we want to do Karma Yoga, Karma Yoga is uh, a devotee is serving the Lord by Jnana, karma, by mind, by body, by intelligence, we are engaging everything. So karma the, or the results of the work can also be offered to the Lord. And when they are offered, then that the entire activity or the work is also purified. And it also not only purified, it, it's, it's uh, let me take this sentence back. When, when the When the results of the work are offered to the Lord, then the entire work becomes service right so now what is that work or the what are the results of the work that are worthy of being offered to the lord right that's the next question if you just like bhoga if you want to offer to the lord it, it should be worthy of all i cannot offer eggs meat onions you know uh, so many other things they, they, they are that's not worthy of being offered to the deities similarly any work, it's not that any kind of work can be offered to the Lord. Right? That work itself should be worthy of being offered. So this will this we'll discuss much later in, in uh, Bhagavad Gita towards the end. So there are three, but I have mentioned this a couple of times in the past. There are three factors of motivation for any kind of work. Jnanam, Gyayam, Avigyata. The knowledge, the object of knowledge, Right, and the knower. This three constitute what motivates one to work. So first of all, our motivation should be pure. What does it mean to be pure? That is what Krishna is describing in this chapter. He is saying, Arjuna, your motivation should not be material gain. Your motivation should be a higher purpose. When understands that will the purpose of all these activities is to satisfy Krishna. So the motivation has to be pure. Then. Uh, then there are five factors for the success of the work. Those have to be pure, right? So what are the five factors? Adhisthanam tatha karta karnam cha prithak vidha vidhas cha prithak cheshta devam chevatra panchamam Adhisthanam, the place and circumstances. So we have to be careful, like, you know, we the kind of work that we choose, we want to not be in a situation which affects our consciousness. For instance, maybe working in a slaughterhouse, that's also a kind of a work. But that, you know, is not a kind of an ideal work that one should take up for one who is uh, aspiring to make spiritual progress, right? Karta, Karta is the doer himself. Karanam cha prithak vida, the senses. The senses should be pure. Well, how are the senses to be pure? Well, that's also Krishna describes in this verse. Well, the senses has to be free from uh, lust, right? Krishna uh, just mentions a couple of verses ago. You know, senses should not be inflicted sense, uh, by the dualities of the sense objects, right? Uh, so senses has to be pure. Vividasya prithak chesta, there should be multiple endeavors. And devam, devam is time, the time factor one has to, uh, you know, especially for any auspicious activities, we make sure we select the right time. And there's, or the sanction of the super soul should be there. Well, ultimately the work, that also we discussed uh, is purified when that uh, yeah the third factor then the outcome the work itself what is the work uh, so these are the three factors which affect the success of the work but what is work itself right so when I say what kind of we should you know working in a slaughterhouse is not an ideal job then what is an ideal job so that is the third thing that is described is uh, what is it karma sangraha what constitutes work so now we have to define what kind of work, what constitutes work. 
so the karma sangraha is basically what is it karta which is a doer karma which is prescribed duties karta karma i can't remember the third one karta karma karteti now it will come to me but one of the the second one is karma which is prescribed duties so that's where the prescribed duties comes into picture that you know not that we take up any job but it's ideal if we take up a work which is according to our nature and the nature is broadly classified into four categories and uh, some you know that's one you can say those who are uh, that corresponds more to like teaching or the brahmanas right they guide the society then there are administrators there are warriors and there are laborers so doesn't now though it's not an ideal varnashram system right now you know it's an industrial society but even within the industrial society we see that this four classes exist right you cannot deny there is academia there is colleges that teach there are administrators who run the government there are business minded people and then there are laborers so these four classes are existing it's not that they are not existing but they are not scientifically organized and what i mean by that is right now the way these classes are organized is that whoever is able to act and fulfill the needs or the job description of each of these four classes they are engaged in them if you are able to get that work done you do it regardless of what happens to you in the process whether you get burned out burnt out or whether it affects your consciousness uh, you know that is not material if you are able to get it done then you know we will hire you so the, that's a very short sighted uh, way of looking at things and these varnas are not systematically cultivated what i mean is that if you go to school it's a monolithic education that means you the entire civilization they get everyone goes to the same school and your k12 education everyone has the same samskaras the same kind of education is provided education is not provided according to what the uh, nature or of of that person is is this person more like you know right from an early age if one is cultivated if somebody has brahmana like propensities or a kshatriya like propensities or a vaishya like propensities then there is more meaningful so what happens is there is a mixed you know people are put into situations or their education is not very customized right it's a monolithic education and after that one is uh, employed based on whatever wherever we can get better remuneration and if we are able to get that job done then we are hired but krishna says in bhagavad gita that it is better to do a job according to one's nature even if one does imperfectly rather than to rather than doing somebody else's job perfectly and it's possible one can do somebody else's job perfectly it is possible right at least externally they are able to do it but if it's not befitting their nature they will it's not sustainable first of all you know they need some monetary remuneration just to be employed you know they are not driven to do that and they will get burnt out in the sense that you know they would get frustrated and when things are not going well they might even give up but when one is en- engaged according to one's nature one never give gives up that society is much more sustainable it's not uh, it's not subject to collapse uh and what was that example i was trying to give yeah so it doesn't matter you know what your domain is somebody say well i like computer engineering right or i like uh, uh you know I, i i like the shipping business right the freight uh, the the freight liners which cross cross the ocean right some you know maybe there's be some people are attracted by that i mean there is for so many reasons but it doesn't matter what domain is you know that domain you one can choose but within each of this domain whether you take computer science or whether you are talking about freight liners uh, any kind of domain each domain there are four categories that means i can teach about computer science or i could be a legislator where uh, you know i i i put regulations on how different it companies should operate or within that domain i might be such a person who 
is in is is very good and is driven by what kind of different businesses i can run within this domain you know new ways of earning money and then there is another class which is just simply attracted by the tools or you know uh, they they are happy to work on a particular kind of technology which is a labor class and that basically inspires them so even no matter what domain you choose within within any domain this four kind of personalities are always there and sometimes we don't know what personality we are because the system does not give us an opportunity to hone or kind of zero in into that particular nature because we receive a monolithic education but it is possible to find out one's nature and when one is engaged according to one's nature then despite of any inherent faults because any activity in this world there is always going to be faults that's also krishna discusses in later right sarva arambhi doshena dumen agni eva anavrita just like fire is covered by smoke all activities have some defects so the smoke well fire is desirable why because fire gives us heat and light and smoke is not desirable but it's the natural outcome well you might say well i have a you know um, purified uh, processed what kind of gas we use like i don't know ethane or uh, but there is no smoke in my home well the thing is those impurities were removed further up in processing right and then maybe at the plant all the impurities were thrown out and you know so we don't experience it at our end but in any kind of extraction process there's always impurities it is just gone more upstream but all kind of fires they have smoke whether it's in the moment or whether it's removed further upstream within the process uh, so their example is still valid and so there's a long answer to your question but the thing is the activities the work that we do we the krishna consciousness is much holistic where you don't have to separate our material identity and our spiritual identity everything is spiritual uh, what needs to change is our consciousness that's why it's called krishna consciousness so at the bare minimum what we could do is we find out we should find out what our nature is and try to uh and might be too late for some of us right uh, well you know you're so further down the line that you can't change a drastic change in your career and in that case i think that's all right uh, you know you could do whatever you can but like if somebody is more brahmana like maybe even in companies nowadays they have opportunities where you could take up more roles which are instructional you know they want to provide in house training and you know a lot of corporations allow that i remember when i started in india you know like some of the it major companies they give you like four months full time training it's almost like they have a college on campus many of their employees they are like teaching they might not have phd which you might need a phd to teach at college but you know their companies allow certain roles where they are just preparing instructional material or giving classes and you know one might again might not be so easy to find but i'm just saying is one has to find out what one's nature is and as much as possible if you are engaged according to one's nature despite of the all the defects of kali yuga uh, uh, we will learn this further krishna says that when one is engaged according to uh, that nature one is 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 protected from any kind of sinful reactions from the defects which are inherent in all this kind of actions just the example that is given in bhagavatam is just like a carnivore animal is not subjected to the sin of consuming or uh, its prey because you cannot expect the carnivore animal to do any different similarly when we are accord- acting according to our nature there are defects are overlooked uh, i think i'll take a pause and i'll let you comment or ask any counter questions you might have this one is thank you thank you you welcome okay i think we finished this verse right yeah okay 59 vishaya vini vartante nirahaarasya dehina rasavarjam raso apishya param drishtva nivartante translation though the embodied soul may be restricted from sense enjoyment the test for sense object remains but ceasing such engagements 
by experiencing a higher taste he is fixed in consciousness so there are two kinds of uh, ways you know i was explaining the uh, in the previous verse many example of the tortoise is given the tortoise is physically restraining the senses and the limbs from the sense objects and for most practitioners maybe that's how things begin in the sense that when we know that certain situations are you know uh, going to drag us in this as pool of enjoyment then we try to physically restrain ourselves especially like children and we are trying to train them they are not self discipline and if there are you know if you want to create a study environment then you have to take all the toys out of the room for instance and there are things around and you would start fiddling with the toys and so uh, similarly some people who have problem with anger management then you know it is a, a coach or a trainer might recommend that hey whenever you are put in a situation you know take a don't uh, act impulsively you know take a deep breath you know count 1 to 20 in your mind and you know you kind of forcing the senses to be physically restrained from the sense objects uh and that's one level and that's how where most people begin but the higher level is and why there is a higher level because we are we are trying to restrain the senses artificially just like you know it says the test for the sense sense object remains and that could be favorable or unfavorable uh, you know like suppose you know somebody has weakness they want like to eat uh, any time they see sweets they cannot resist and they want to eat sweets uh, so one way one can do that is i don't know there are like uh, some containers available where you put, put you know you put the cookies or any kind of sweets within that container and there is a lock and there is a timer on it and you know this kind of things are sold it kind of physically restricts one makes it difficult it's not easily accessible so there are products available in the market which would make uh, you know well one kind is you know like easy dispenser you want to get the contents out very easily but then there are uh containers which make it very difficult to extract and so that's one way of physically putting some sort of barriers to the sense objects like uh, the addiction of the devices is another big problem right and uh, the one click buying from amazon and that is addictive shopping it, it promotes that and so there are manufacturers of uh, smartphones which are like bare bones smartphones you only can you know text message there is no you know social media and you know they make it very uh, the, the 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 phone it, it will serve the purpose it has it has also you know bare minimum functionalities but make it difficult for one to use and that difficulty or the barrier is so that one does not become addicted to all the things that uh, uh, you know the, that these addictive technologies have to offer uh, that's uh, but what happens is uh the taste remains in the sense that you know we are artificially trying to put those barriers but we are not self disciplined right but, but the higher engagement is what the higher engagement is that one is not dependent on so thus artificial barriers but one is able to restrain one senses because the senses are now dovetailed in a higher consciousness and they have experienced something that is higher right and they have understood the futility of those things that uh, one was attracted to in the past so that is a better way of uh, controlling one senses and so that's the uh, example that is given over here and there are ma many examples uh, even from scriptures uh, different puranas where we we see that you know that artificial restraint can only work so much right eventually you know it will and when when those barriers artificial barriers break you know they break and they come up with a deluge and one basically indulges even more because one has been artificially restraining oneself so much and for so long that when eventually when the barriers break you know they they just uh, indulge to an extreme extent uh, but you know that might be the place where 
one might have to begin depending on individual situation. Ideally, if one is directly able to engage in higher taste, then one can surpass the the phase where one is putting artificial barriers because that is not sustainable in the long term. In the purpose of Prabhupada rise there, unless one one is transcendentally situated, it is not possible to cease from sense enjoyment. You see, it's not possible. The senses are very strong. It's not easy. You cannot control it, but you can dovetail it, right? It's like if somebody, the, the horses is easier to d change the direction in which the horses are running. It's always a more effort if you want to kind of want to bring them to a screech halt, right? There's more effort required. So the process of restriction from sense enjoyment by rules and regulation is something like restricting a diseased person from certain types of eatables. Patient, however, neither likes such restrictions nor loses taste for eatables. He is a perfect example, Srila Prabhupada has given. Right. So when we are diseased, there are so many restrictions. We don't like it, first of all. And then uh, the taste remains. Similarly, sense restriction by some spiritual process. So Ashtanga Yoga is one of the processes. And then you know there are different phases of it. Yama, Niyama, right? So do's, don'ts, asana, how you sit, pranayam, pratyahar, pranayam is basically breathing in, but it more than that, it also means uh, pran has, pran generally means life air, but pran has a deeper meaning. Pran also means the impulses because the pran the life air is 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 an impulse only for the nose but similarly the remaining four senses also have impulses so pran doesn't mean just taking the smell or the breath in but also refers to uh, what the eyes perceive right what the ears hear or listen to uh, that's a deeper meaning so pranayam pratyahar Right, so uh, there is a restriction. Dharana, dhyana is meditation. So in this way, uh, again, if you see the phases, you see it's going from gross to subtle. So in do's and don'ts, they are more external impositions. Then asana is more about regulations. Pranayam is again, you know, we are subtly controlling uh, the what the senses perceive what we want to let the impulses in and um, then dharana then one after doing all that one becomes steady then dhyana then you have to apply mind and intelligence so even if one begins at a sensual level of restriction one eventually has to progress to subtle level of restriction then you can you know and to uh, impose those mental filters so you don't need physical barriers when one has mental filters then the physical barriers are not needed so again, all these are recommended for. So he said there is a systematic process, um, and you know here it's mentioned as less intelligence, less intelligent in the sense that there is a better way to do it. In the sense that if one, uh, so what this control does, it brings us from negation to neutrality, right? It only brings from negation to neutrality. We are we are being drawn by the impulses of sense objects which might degrade us, and we want we don't want to degrade. And so, uh, by following this process of Ashtanga Yoga, uh, one comes to the neutral platform. But it only brings us to zero. But there's an entire range of positive spectrum beyond that. And when one is actually attracted by the uh, the the beauty of the Supreme Lord Krishna and one instead of restraining one engages those senses in the positive way and then that may, that leads to advancement in Krishna consciousness just like child the child has so much energy right it's always jumping running around and you know a lot of time uh, children they especially younger children they cause destruction in the sense that because they don't know what to do with the energy right and sometimes my son would go and you know a sharp object somehow he gets hold of a sharp pen and he starts poking right in a couch he might create holes um, and so uh, there's too much energy don't know what to do 
now if you artificially try to restrain him, you say you're going to sit at one place 30 minutes, you're not going to move, you cannot jump, you do, right? So that is, that's one way of controlling it, but it can only be successful so much, right? I mean, there is a limit <laughs> to which a child can sit at one place. And uh, even when the child is sitting, the taste remains. He says, no, 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 I need to go and start jumping. I need to do something, right? But if the child is engaged positively, he said, okay, you like to use a lot of energy. Okay, help me do the dishes, you know, uh, push the garbage can out, right? Uh, I have this uh, groceries that I brought in, right? You like to move things around. Well, you know, lift, lift and bring them up, right? So uh, if you if you try to engage them positively, then it's much easier than trying to artificially restrain the senses. So this is what the sum and substance of what the verse is. So when we are engaging our senses in the service of Krishna, that becomes much more easier than trying to restrain the senses by the processes of Ashtanga Yoga. Therefore, restrictions are there for less intelligent neophytes in the spiritual advancement of life. Such restrictions are only good until one actually has a taste, a higher taste for Krishna consciousness. When one is actually Krishna conscious, he automatically loses his taste for pale things. Any questions on this particular verse? Okay. What's number 60? Yatato hi api kaunte ya puru sasya vipaschitaha indriyani pramathani haranti prasabam manaha Translation, the senses are so strong and impetuous, O Arjuna, that they forcibly carry away the mind even of a man of discrimination who is endeavoring to control them. So, uh, it's a very important verse. One should never underestimate the power of senses. And one should not take them lightly. That is the import of this verse. And there are many examples of them Sri Prabhupada is quoting in the purport. Uh, just like, you know, in a war or in a competition in sports, you know, which are the teams which are successful. They never take the enemy lightly. Right? If one becomes complacent, then one cannot succeed. So earlier we saw that the senses, they are compared to serpents. Right? Venomous serpents. So if we start, if we put trust in our senses, you know, no, they are fine. You know, I, I, I know what I am doing. You know, my senses, they are, they are very docile. You know, they are... I, I can trust them, they're not going to create trouble for me. Then what happens? Uh, we, we put that over trust. The Like one should never trust a serpent, right? Uh, you know, you can say that, uh, in, like every time, anytime somebody sees a snake, what's the immediate reaction? Like, you know, we are, we are startled. You know, you, you don't take it lightly. And that's why this metaphor, they are for a meaning. They're not randomly chosen. So if we... If we allow senses to act uh, uh, unrestrained, then they are just going to bring degradation. So even a man of discrimination, one who say one might be a good driver, man of discrimination because intelligence is a driver, right? Senses are compared to the horses. One might be an expert driver, but if one man driving the, the chariot, for a fraction of a second, if one is distracted, what will happen? Right, the one can crash or one might go off the cliff. Just like driving a car, somebody might have a 30 years of experience driving. One might be an expert driver. Is there any guarantee that I was a good driver for 30 years? That means you know what? I maybe I can be a little distracted while driving. No, you cannot, because a moment one is distracted, there could be a crash, and one can lose one life. So the same analogy applies that one's, one might be very intelligent, but if one makes any lapses, allows things to lapse, becomes uh, complacent, then there is, all, oh, there is a high possibility that one will fall down from the path. In the purport, Srila Prabhupada is mentioning that there are many sages, many philosophers, transcendentalists, who try to conquer the senses. But in spite of their endeavors, even the greatest of, of them, they fall victim 
to sense enjoyment when their mind is agitated because they are artificially trying to control the mind. So one of the example that is given is that of a Vishwamitra who was a sage. He was doing tapasya for so many years, right? And then Indra sent one apsara, and he was attracted uh, to Menka by the desire for sex enjoyment. And so this yogi, while though he has so much practice, right? I mean, you can see Vishwamitra, sage like Vishwamitra, was a man of discrimination. Not only that, he was practiced in different methods of sense control by going through severe penance. You know, when he's able to control hunger, you know, avoiding food, uh, able to control the urges of the uh, belly and by yoga practice. But he's not engaged positively, right? All these artificial means of restraint, they are not uh, sustainable. So again, there are many other instances to Prabhupada rise in the history of the world. Uh, in Bhagavatam, of course, the story is that of Ajamil, who was a Brahmana. He had good samskaras right from his childhood. He was following, he was very clean in thoughts and practice. He was serving the Lord nicely. Once while passing through a forest, he saw a Sudra who was enjoying uh, a prostitute. And uh, he was attracted by that. He so attracted that he decided to get uh, connect with that prostitute. He... he he gave up his good wife, you know, he neglected his family, he brought the prostitute in his home. In order to maintain the prostitute, she, he engaged in so many sinful activities, stealing, murdering, right? So his whole life was degraded. So even he was a man of discrimination. Uh, so that's another example. So in this way, there are many examples uh, in scriptures. The other example, that's why a lot of restrictions are given even in Srimad Bhagavatam. It says, uh, Yeah, there is a very beautiful verse. What does it say? Yeah, Matra Svasra Duhitrava Na Avavikto Ashano Bhavet Balavan Indriya Gramo Vidvamsam Api Karsati. So, one of the injunction is Matra Svasra Duhitra. Ma- matra means mother, Svasra sister, Duhitra daughter. One should keep a distance one should not assume a position in very close to even one's mother one's sister or even one's daughter for an adult man one should not come in close physical association well one might say she is my mother right uh, but what bhagavatam says is that balavan indriya gramo the senses they are so strong the group of senses they are so powerful Vidvamsam, one who, even who is learned and who is well trained with good samskaras might be agitated. Uh, again, these are, you might say, well, these are extreme examples, but we find often situation, uh, we, we see news or there are situations where, you know, people, they are compromised when they are put into, uh, they, they, they think, you know, they, they are beyond all this. Uh, but then they could be afflicted because these senses are very strong. So this is Sastra Ukti, it's from scriptures. And, and, and when, when we see, of course, there are self-realized souls like Narada Muni, you know, uh, you know he, he's not disturbed, even when put into such situations. Uh, but the instructions are there for common men to, to understand that. The example, well, somebody might say that, uh, well, Narada Muni is even the teacher of Vyasadeva. In Bhagavatam, we find that when Kayadu is the wife of uh, Hiranyakashipu, she was expecting Prahlad in her womb. And the Indra and all the demigods, when they found out that uh, she was expecting a child, well, she said that if Hiranyakashipu is such a big Dana, what his child would be? He would also be such a Dana. So let's just uh, abort that child. The Narad Muni comes. And while Indra was taking away Kayadu, he says, uh, you cannot take her away because I know the child is not a demon, he is a devotee. So, the, in the, the, of course, everyone listens to Narada Muni, so they let her go. And because Hiranyakashipu had gone to perform severe austerities, you know, there was no one to take care of her. He is a sannyasi, he is a renounced order of life, he has no connection with women. He brings Kayadu to her ashram. And every day he is reciting Srimad Bhagavatam. Why? More so because, of course, for the benefit of Kayadu, but the child 
in the womb if you even listen shrimad bhagavatam right from young age then you know his natural devotion for narayana that he had would be nurtured so he does that right so now no sanyasi would bring a woman to one's ashram you know it contradicts uh, the injunction of the scriptures of course narad muni is able to do that so again you know one has to understand how the instructions set of instructions which are very applicable for those who are conditioned uh, they do not apply to personalities like narada muni so he had uh, you know he is full he is goswami he is not godas he is completely in control of one's senses okay so without engaging the mind in krishna one cannot see such material engagement uh, a practical example is given by shri yamuna charya who is a great saint a devotee so here he is saying that again you know this is for people who have achieved the perfectional stage you know they are not uh, they, they have developed a higher taste and when they have they developed the higher taste all engagements of the senses with sense object they afi- appear you know not attractive anymore that's what it means like right? what was it what's the p- verse over here uh, in the previous verse right yeah it was a previous verse it was saying there are two kinds of controls one is one tries to control the senses artificially the other is when one develops a higher taste then the engagement in the lower nature or lower engagement of the senses is automatically stopped so that is a better process so yamuna charya was a great devotee of course he was a king earlier and you know king generally kshatriyas uh, they have many wives and you know they are uh, you know they have access to a lot of wealth and riches and so they have pleasures for uh, they have opportunities and arrangements for a lot of different kind of enjoyments and as a king certainly he would have enjoyed a lot right but when he was self realized and you know properly situated in devotion uh, in in the later part of his life he is saying and he is recalling his previous life in his previous ashram and he says now that i think about what uh, how i passed or how, how i spent my my life previously i am not able to relate to it right even even if i try to remember uh, those i do not try uh, try to remember those instances he says oh i was engaging in these activities i can't i can't relate to it uh, why because he has now experiencing a much higher taste so that's what he is saying that uh, being engaged in the service of the lotus feet of lord krishna is experiencing such transcendental humor that all the enjoyments that he had with different kind of women when he thinks about that he he just says oh this is this was so distasteful you know i i i uh, you know I, i cannot even relate to it so that is what his experience so of course this cannot be artificially assumed but that's a natural outcome right so there are many examples uh, we we discussed is uh, just in the previous verse your prabhupada was mentioning when a higher taste is developed then one there is not need an artificial restriction just like you know i was giving the example of a child a child we cannot artificially we can only so much discipline the child artificially you know the child does not know where to spend one's energy and might end up spending energy in a destructive way if we artificially try to restrain it it won't work long but the child is engaged positively and is provided proper direction then the child would actually start developing taste oh this is nice instead of me running around jumping around maybe i could do craft or some art work uh, or learn some music and then the child likes starts liking music oh this is nice see what happened now the child because the child has developed a higher taste for learning music and he finds enjoyment in them then it's not going to run around with a sharp nail trying to poke the couch right so <laughs> Uh, so that lower engagement na- naturally stops krishna consciousness is such a transcendentally nice thing that automatically material enjoyment becomes distasteful it is as if a hungry man had satisfied his hunger by a sufficient quantity of nutritious eatables maharaj ambarish also conquered a great yogi durvasha muni simply because his mind was engaged in krishna consciousness there is another story of ambarish maharaj in shrimad bhagavatam 
um, the Durvasha Muni, who is literally means Durvasha, means everyone wants to stay away. Vasa means stay, Dur means away, because he gets angry very easily. And then uh, once he gets angry with Amrish Maharaj, he is a pure devotee of the Lord for no reason. Amrish Maharaj in Vraj Bhumi and Vrindavan is performing. He's taken this vow to do Nirjala Ekadasi for entire year. So in one year you have what 20, 24, 12 months to Ekadasi is like 24, 25 Ekadasis. You do Nirjala Ekadasi, each of them, every one of them. Durvasa Muni comes on Dvadasi right about when the time was to break the fast. And as a courteous uh, Kshatriya, he says, well, uh, you know, you just arrived. I will break the fast with you. Why don't you go and take uh, a bath in Yamuna? So Durvasa Muni goes, but he he does not arrive on time in the, in the, because the fast has to be broken within a certain time limit. And so Maharaj Amrish, he is now in a dilemma. He doesn't want to offend the Muni by breaking the fast in his absence. At the same time, he's supposed to break the fast. So in scripture, you say if you take Achman, it is considered as breaking fast. At the same time, it's not breaking a fast because it's just one drop of water. So he does that. But anyway, Durvasa Muni finds him out because of his mystic power and he's very angry. He gets angry very easily. And so he says very harsh words to Amrish Maharaj and he offends him. And uh, because Amrish Maharaj is a pure devotee, he does not take any offense personally. But the Lord had given his Sudarsan Chakra as a personal servant to Amrish Maharaj, he say, to protect him. And so he observes that Durvasa Muni has been offensive. So then the uh, Sudarsan Chakra tries to chastise Durvasa Muni. Durvasa Muni goes all around the universe, goes to Brahma, goes to Shiva for asking shelter, but no one can protect him. And then goes to Vishnu. Vishnu says that, well, you offended my devotee. I don't have any problem. The only thing is you have, I mean, he didn't say that. He says that, well, uh, what he said is that ultimately he has to forgive you. I mean, I, I cannot. Uh, so Durvasa Muni comes back to Amrish Maharaj and asks for forgiveness. He's, and Mara, uh, Amrish Maharaj feels that, well, I was not even offended, you know, I, I felt that maybe I did not do something right. So that's the nature of a devotee. He does not even feel offended. And then, uh, he, he, of course, because he didn't feel offended, there was no question of forgiveness. Uh, and so in this way, they were able to reconcile. But the point is that, um, yeah, Prabhupada is giving this example that a hungry man satisfies his hunger by a sufficient quantity of nutritious eatables. And so the material enjoyment becomes distasteful. So Maharaj Ambarish, yeah, so it, was, it was impossible that anyone would conquer Durvasa Muni is in a way is unconquerable. Everyone is afraid of Durvasa. But because he was fixed in Krishna consciousness, he was not agitated when he was put into that difficult situation. And not that he wanted to overpower Durvasa Muni, but by the mercy of the Lord, who wanted to teach Durvasa Muni a lesson. Uh, by the arrangement of the Lord, Durvasa Muni was conquered. So this is the understanding of this verse. Any questions on this? Verse number 60. No? So it's already uh, six. Uh, Jamin, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I have a question. Like, like in our day to day life, it's very difficult for us to control any senses. Then, how we can practice controlling our anger? I mean, that's the most one which we utilize. Either we are at home in difficult situations uh, with the kids or a family or at the workplace where a lot of things are happening which you like or dislike. And, and if you try to uh, control it, that sense, sometimes it is not good for your health also. And we just bust out ourselves. So in, uh, in a better manner, how we can do it. I mean, maybe it's not related to the the point we are discussing, but I, I just thought that I would ask you. It's uh, very much related to the point, and uh, this is the topic of discussion in our next class. Here, right here, we ended at verse 60. In 62 and 63, Krishna explains, first of all, he explains the mechanism why anger develops. Verse 62 is explaining the reason 
why anger develops and what happens when anger develops so for anything you want to control you have to understand the mechanism first right if one one doesn't understand the mechanism or by which how th- like root cause analysis we do this in our jobs right to solve a problem well before we solve the problem you have to find out the root cause and once we know the root cause we can address it so this is a topic of discussion uh, for the next class i think we'll discuss that in detail next time uh, but to uh, briefly answer your question one needs to understand that all kind of emotions they have utility that's the first thing to understand when emotions are in our control then all emotions can be doubted in the service of krishna even anger can be doubted in the service of krishna hanuman hanuman used his anger to ban lanka so that was his service that's good way to manifest uh, anger is needed sometimes when other things don't work then anger is needed to bring things in control like child child sometimes we we try to explain the child nicely you know in this way that way but the child still doesn't listen then anger is needed now there is a distinction in the anger distinction is that the sh- there is something called show of anger in the sense that the anger is there but you don't let anger overpower one that what we will discuss next time you don't let anger bewilder one's memory from anger comes delusion delusion because of delusion there is bewilderment of memory when memory is bewildered intelligence is lost right so when hanuman was overpowered by anger he was sorry wrong phrase hanuman was not overpowered by anger he displayed anger because uh, you know he wanted to teach lesson to ravana but if he was overpowered by anger then he would have make, made a wrong choice sometimes you know if for instance he, he, he was not overpowered by anger he, he was definitely angry but he was calculatively thinking that okay let me go if i want to burn lanka what will happen if i burn lanka he is thinking about pros and cons what are the advantages well the advantages is if there is going to be a war eventually between the army of rama and ravana then one should know the strength and the weaknesses of the army so this is my you know uh, surveillance is on recon operation right he wants to test how strong is ravana's army so if i create some havoc right then uh, you know i'll i'll get an opportunity to test it out he's thinking okay what are the negative impacts that might happen how would lord rama think about it so you see he 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 did unless there is some anger one cannot you know attack you know there is there is there is a lot there is a lot of anger and passion like somebody when goes into a war without anger or passion one cannot fight but a kshatriya is trained to channel and doubt tail and anger and is still calculative one is you know, if 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 hanuman was overpowered by anger then he would just act without any discrimination he says oh he insulted he me insulted lord rama you know this is how he's treating mother sita i'm just going to whimsically one might he might start attacking right without uh, proper uh, deliberation right so that is being overpowered by anger right you don't let anger overpower you but if you are able to control anger that that control anger has a utility if i don't if, if my if the child frustrates me then it's my problem then i am letting that situation make me so frustrated and let that anger develop to a such an extent that i lose all discrimination and there are people who, who are not able to do that right and so when they are so much overwhelmed by anger they might st- hit the child very badly physically you know physically hurt the child so badly so that is being overpowered by anger that one should not allow to do otherwise all emotions have utility see that's why it's called krishna consciousness we are not against any emotions that scriptures are not against any emotions all emotions have utility anger also has utility so when there is a need that anger needs to be displayed to the child because child is not listening but i am not letting the anger overwhelm me that means i won't hit the child i won't you know thrash him but when the child is able to see that anger projected towards him or her 
then the child child will become serious oh, this is serious okay you know I, I need to listen so everything has a utility uh, so that's the main point you know uh, all emotions have a utility but we don't let them overpower us just like happiness we just learned today right earlier that one who is fixed in mind does not let happiness overpower one's oneself is not elated when things are very nice so if one is so in order to control our negative emotions we have to learn how to control our positive emotions because the two are they, they are the that's why this world is called the world of dualities two sides of the same coin they are interconnected if you can control one you can control another right so we have to control our emotions that doesn't mean that you don't feel happy when things are nice but you don't let overpower those situations overpower uh, one and so to the extent they will lose all lose our discrimination like people you know they might win a win a lottery or something or you know they are so overwhelmed they might party like crazy and you know there are instances you know, there was recently there was this uh, in india somebody forwarded me this video i don't know the kind of a music competition or dance competition somebody wins something and that person is so excited he starts jumping on the stage and he has a heart attack right on the stage he collapses and died right at the moment right he's like he could not uh, contain his happiness uh, that's an extreme example but again the point is that uh, we should uh, you know we should not let emotions overpower us so that's the essence but next week we'll learn the mechanism of how anger arises and what's the outcome when that anger overpowers us and how we can control it but uh, Uh, i just wanted to make that point that anger in itself is not bad you know all emotions can be engaged in the service of the lord the only one is envy if you are envious there is no <laughs> uh, envious means oh, this person has it i don't have it only i should have it this per- other should not have it that is envy right envy has no place so envy is more dangerous otherwise anger can also be applied in the service of the lord does it answer your question thanks sir jamin bhai maybe we will discuss more in in the next class yeah definitely we look forward thank you any other questions before we conclude okay if not we'll conclude the class over here we'll continue from verse 61 next time thank you very much hari krishna hari krishna hari krishna prabhu hari krishna thank you